Now it's 10 o'clock and it is time to start. Good morning, dear participants. I cannot see you, which is a bit strange uh, because you are quite numerous today, um, to join the Organim uh, web event on strengthening the internal market, time for a new deal for European standardization. My name is uh, Philippe Portalier. I am Director of Better Regulation Compliance and standards at Organim. And it is really an honor for me uh, to uh, have outstandingly knowledgeable speakers with me today. We initially aimed at making a small roundtable under Chatham House rules at the end of March. And like everybody, um, we had to change our plans due to confinement measures. Today, we will experiment a different uh, setting thanks to the digital technology. We are now uh, close to 110 participants. Uh, the large majority of you are representing technology companies and trade associations that are contributing to the development of technical standards at European and international level. I wish also to acknowledge the participation of our friends from SEMS and ANEC and ETSI, as well as from ANEC. Finally, I would like to especially welcome the participants from several member states, from the European Parliament and the European Commission, who have a decisive role to play in helping us out with solving our problem. I'm quite sure that our distinguished speakers will keep your attention undivided until the end, which is foreseen at 11.30, after a half an hour extra session to answer your remaining questions. Um, let's move on. Uh, but um, I would like first to go over some house uh, rules and pass the floor to Georgiana, who is the master of the technical ceremony today. Georgiana, please go over our rules for the good management of this meeting. Thank you, Philippe. Good morning, everyone. Just a few notes about how the meeting will work in practice. So you have noticed already that you are muted. Um, therefore, the way to ask questions is via the chat box you are seeing in your toolbar. Um, the speakers will take a few questions at the end of their presentations and an extra half an hour, so from 11 to 11.30, is provided at the end to, to answer any remaining questions. Uh, there will also be several polls throughout the event to just to guard your uh, opinion. Um, we are tweeting about this event uh, with the hashtags EU industry, standards and New Deal for standards. We are also recording this meeting. If you have any issues seeing, hearing, answering polls, please write via chat or write the phone number down and, and give me a call and I'll try to help you. After the meeting, you will receive the support slides and the link to the recording. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, also, regarding the question, if you address your question to one of the panelists, please mention his name or her name and make it short with uh, a question mark at the end. Um, so, make use of the chat box to raise your question in a concise and crisp way. Uh, but let's first set the scene. Why this seminar? Because we have a problem. We have a problem today because standards are primarily a tool to support a wide range of economic activities for interoperability, performance, safety, circularity, or resilience of products. We will hear the business perspective from our expert panelist, Paul kubek Brack. Unfortunately, the European administration considers that they have a responsibility in uh, requesting standards for the support of EU law, that they have to monitor their development, check the outcome against the law and only then take an implementing measure to make them available for use by us, the economic operators. As those so-called harmonized standards would be a different species, they only see them as an extension of EU law. I will explain later 
why this is a regulatory overshoot. Consequently, we have a problem because the lawyers have taken the driver's seat of technical experts. Likewise, they completely sideline the economic dimension of standards and impose many administrative constraints on the way standards are requested, developed, and assessed. We will hear what practical impact it has on medical devices with uh, Katerina Bruzasco. This situation is based on purely legalistic considerations that are um, disincentivizing industry stakeholders and thereby threatening a pillar of the single market. All panelists will explain why in their respective presentations. Therefore, we need a fix, which is even more urgent to help us as we are faced with the current unprecedented economic crisis. Metapiece Shu will explain the main avenues that we believe need to be explored to find a durable solution to this situation. So let me uh, shortly present uh, to you our panelists. Starting with the ladies, I'm pleased to welcome Katerina Buzasco, who is a research and compliance expert at IBA Medical Device and a member of COSIR, uh, leading a European trade association representing the interest of medical devices such as ventilators or MRI scanners. Katerina is deeply involved in standardization at both the European level with the Belgian Electrotechnical Committee and at the international level with the ISO and the IC. Meta Pitschuk, <coughs> my friend, is the leading senior advisor of Dansk industry on internal market issues. Meta is extremely skilled at providing cross-sector solutions backed by 25 years of various experience in the private and public sectors. For the past few years, she has spearheaded, together with Bert Nachtegal, the chair of Organim Standardization Policy Task Force, Organim's advocacy in the SMART, this uh, three yearly standardization market relevance roundtable between the industry and the European Commission. And finally, Paul Kuberg Vandenbrack, who is with us today as chair of Business Europe Free Movement of Goods Working Group. I know Paul for more than a decade, and he's very good at voicing in a pragmatic way the concerns of companies, both large and small, backed with his insightful 35 years long experience in various companies, not to mention his current role as manager of Philips Intellectual Property and Standards. I will spare you my bio so that we could directly jump into the matter. Um, the legal framework, straitjacket or springboard for standards users. Well, many of you are familiar with the legal framework of union harmonization legislation in force for placing most of the consumers and professional products on the single market. Uh, but let me present you the broader picture of the EU single market legislation. It starts more than four decades ago when the first product safety directives were enforced on the so-called new approach model. It was at the time when the EU policymaker understood how useful could be to add trust in products circulating on the territories of all member states and thereby reduce red tape and technical bias to trade. Over time, this model was codified in the first goods package. Uh, and it was um, really uh, um, uh, in, in 2008, uh, at the time when uh, Malcolm Harbour was chair of the IMCO committee, it really helped us. It was updated last year with the regulation 1020 uh, of 2019 on market surveillance. This better regulation model sets a division of tasks between involved parties. First, the EU regulator establishes legislative requirements in terms of levels and objectives of uh, user safety or of environment protection or energy efficiency. They are set in the essential requirements of these directives and regulation. That's the blue box. 
then manufacturers are invited to apply a number of conformity assessment procedures from self-assessment of the risk to full quality assurance. And that, in that they are supported by third party certification bodies. So this uh, uh, is to ensure that the product design and the manufacturing process are uh, fit for uh, meeting the EU law. Third, to first ease the pro further ease the process, the system provides that manufacturers that are using harmonized standards may benefit from the presumption of conformity with EU law. The development of these standards is facilitated by the three European standardization organizations that are recognized in Regulation 1025-2012 on uh, European uh, standardization. These are SEN, SENELEC, and ETSI. And fourth, uh, member states are invited to trust that products um, uh, placed on the single market meet the latest state of the art and comply with the high level of protection set in EU law. Under the NLF standards have three dimensions. And this is very important to understand uh, these uh, uh, three layers. In the first dimension, standards respond to a technical purpose. I mentioned that interoperability, performance, resilience, etc. They are elaborated by voluntary experts, mostly on the payroll of uh, companies in an open, transparent, democratic, consensus building and inclusive process uh, that is done within the standardization organization. This activity is over 100 years old, like in the electrotechnical field. In their second dimension, standards are developed and adopted by a European standardization organization according to a common internal rule of SEN and SENELEC and ETSI all national conflicting standards should be withdrawn. And this does not depend on the EU administration. It means that the standard is fit for use across the whole of the EU territory. Uh, and that's a, a great help for, for companies. And then comes the last uh, dimension, the regulatory dimension. When a standard is developed under a standardization request of the European Commission, and its reference is eventually published in the official journal of the EU, then it triggers a legal uh, benefit uh, because the citation, uh, and as it was confirmed recently by the uh, rulings of the European Court of Justice, it opens um, the possibility for potential users of harmonized standards to benefit from the presumption of conformity. So the legal framework, is it a, a, a straitjacket or a springboard for standards user? Well, at the moment it's rather a, a, a straitjacket. It is really paramount to understand that harmonized standards as such although they are requested by the European Commission, monitored and checked against the new SETI framework legislation, and eventually cited in the official journal, do not support EU legislation directly. This is the use of standards, or the fact that standard, the, the, the products comply with their technical specifications that has a legal effect to the benefit of manufacturers. It means that market surveillance authorities may not object ex ante to the free circulation on their territory of products that claim such presumption of conformity with EU law. Unless, of course, authorities would have evidence a formal or substantial lack of conformity of that very product. In other words, to support the application of EU legislation and policies, harmonized standards should be used and no one no one will use such standards if these when they are cited in the official journal are technically outdated 
or are not fit for the market needs anymore. So the new approach model that I just described dates back from 1973. So it's over four decades old. The first di directive that tried it out very successfully actually is the low voltage directive on electrical safety because it is essentially unchanged since then. The council decision of uh, 7 of May 1985 describes the new approach as a public private partnership relying on mutual trust among the parties, manufacturers, standardizers, the European Commission and member states. The first goods package in 2008 uh, has endorsed the approach and erected it as a regulatory model, which expanded beyond product safety to support the application of many other EU policy objectives. At that time, standardization requests were still a contract proposal to the European Standards Organization, whose stakeholders were still entrusted to develop high quality standards with flexibility fit for their market needs. Since Regulation 1025 2012 on U European standardization, this formal gentleman agreement between the parties was turned into a regulation that was the end of mutual trust. In 2016, the Court of Justice declared itself competent and two years later, the European administration turned the whole process into a series of administrative constraints. I stop here as Paul will go into more detail about these constraints and their practical consequences on businesses. So, uh, thank you for uh, listening um, and watching uh, the slides. Now it's polling time. Uh, Georgiana, can you put on uh, the poll? We would like to ask you uh, if, uh, in your opinion, uh, how important is a well-functioning standardization system for the smooth operation of the internal market? Georgiana? Yes, the poll should be on your screens now. Please select one of these options. We will give 30 seconds. Great, responses are coming in fast, so thank you for that. And once we will close the poll, we will show the results on screen. Okay. It seems that no other answer is coming, so I will close the poll. Okay. And I will share the results on screen. Well, the, the answer is quite straightforward. We have uh, uh, close to 90% uh, uh, or more, 94% that believe um, it is it's very important or important to have a well-functioning single market uh, with a support of a, a functioning standardization system. So um, well, it doesn't surprise me given uh, the audience, but it's a clear sign for our uh, participants from um, authorities and uh, the European institutions that uh, it is a, a key feature that needs to be uh, uh, put uh, well in order. Thank you. Uh, now, um, I don't know if you have uh, any questions on my presentation. Um, There's uh, nothing maybe... in the chat right now. Yes, uh, Meta, do, have you noted some uh, questions? Nothing from the chat, no. No. So it was maybe... clear. 
my presentation was a bit dense. So if you have any questions on uh, these legal aspects, the presumption of conformity, etc., don't uh, hesitate, shoot and use the chat box. I will uh, respond to these questions at the end of the, 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 the webinar session from 11 o'clock on. Paul, I believe it is up to you. I will pass the slides. You just say next slides and okay. I will- Can you go uh, to the, the title slide first? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Philippe. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I can be heard? Yes. Good. So I will try to clarify why today's subject is so essential to industry. Uh, standards and regulations, as Philippe pointed out, have an intricate relationship in the European Union, and I will uh, place this in context of business stakes to start with. Next slide. Uh, oops. No, no not this one. Yeah, Number this two. one. Yeah, that one. Uh, so companies invest in standard setting because standards help them deliver superior value to their customers. This one, yes, thank you. Um, so they invest in standard setting because standards help deliver superior value to customers. And that is what competition is really about. Standards create value and that value may actually accrue to any market player, both on the supply and the demand side. And there are all sorts of examples. I give you a few from the pictures on this uh, slide. If you go by a classic train from Spain to France, uh, the train will pause at the border for a swap of wheels because the rail width is not the same. Should a unified rail width have been agreed timely, society would have been way better off. And for this reason, China actually standardized carriage tracks with for more than 1500 years ago at the time of the emperor that built the Great Wall. Another example is the nuts and bolts here on the slide. In the 60s, if you wanted to repair a car made in the UK, you needed wrenches of imperial measures. And they were very close to the metric wrenches that were used for continental cars. So if you wasn't aware, you would even spoil both your tools and your nuts and bolts. Those times are now behind us, but even in 1999 still, a Mars lander crashed because one supplier had been using feet and inches instead of meters and centimeters. The most spectacular example on this picture here is the sea container standard. It's merely giving the dimensions and the structural integrity of a metal box, no more, no less. But it enabled a global ecosystem of ships, trucks, cranes and trains that dramatically reduced the burden and cost of transportation, and that in turn helped to boost massive international trade and global distribution of supply chains. So a very impressive effect of a standard, really. Next to value creation, standards often affect the distribution of value between market players. So the value cre creation is about making the pie bigger. This is about distributing the pie, who gets which piece of the pie. And that is a stronger motive to participate in standard setting because companies, they primarily invest in standard setting for the effect on competitive dynamics. And they are able to influence that effect through active participation. To give you an example, a standard for a process to manage waste material streams, very important in today's age, is easiest to implement for those players who already do it in a way close to the standard. Companies that do not have a process yet are in turn better off than those that must substantially change the existing processes and tools because the standard differs from what they have implemented before. An important aspect is that companies strive for globally uniform standards because non-uniformity deprives them and their customers of the benefits of scale. Diversity in business processes products or services is an enormous cost drive and it can have downsides for society as well like waste of materials or energy. I hope that all this illustrates that standards create and distribute value in many different ways and the application of standards to help comply with regulatory requirements is very useful but it's just one particular aspect. It does not help to separate that aspect out in a dedicated standard 
because the most efficient and effective way for business is a minimal set of standards to cover all aspects of a product or service integrally. And standards are really not an appendix to legislation, but they are guidance for engineers how to create solutions that meet a broad range of requirements as set by the buyer, the end user, the legislator, and many others. Next slide. So the EU has this great regulatory paradigm introduced in the 80s known as the new approach or recently the new legislative framework. Philippe told us all about it. Legal requirements are specified in laws at a high level and technical details how to achieve them are specified in standards. If a product complies with the so-called harmonized standards, all parties concerned can safely assume it complies with the laws. This notion is legally anchored as the presumption of conformity and it's legally an effect of the reversal of the burden of proof. And in that sense, it elevates the level of legal certainty for all players. Nonetheless, the economic actor remains the sole responsible party for compliance and carries all the liabilities for possible non-compliance. So this principle does not imply that a product could not be taken from the market in case a serious issue would unfold. And it does not transfer any responsibility or liability to the public authorities. Over and above that, there are mechanisms to correct an exceptional situation, and sometimes that happens due to progressive insights, for instance, in which the harmonized standard fails to cover the legal requirements appropriately. All this worked well for decades, and it is seen to be best in class because it makes the best of the abilities of legal versus technical experts. And it strikes a good balance between flexibility, legal certainty, and appropriate protection against risks. Interestingly, China, in its reform of the past years, took inspiration from it and moved a lot in this direction. Unfortunately, the European Union is actually drifting away from its own invention now by applying it in a very suboptimal manner. To ensure compliance uh, at all times, businesses must design and maintain and deploy very thorough processes. Can I go to the next slide? Yeah, okay, you're here already. Um, so businesses must, must have these, these processes for compliance. And that is really much more complex than it seems. And that forms a very substantial cost factor. It includes knowing very deeply the legislation, the requirements for conformity assessment procedures and declaration of conformity, not only in the EU, but in all markets where the company is acting and the details of all the applicable standards. And all these inputs are changing continually, day by day. They must be transposed into company policies and work instructions that guarantee compliance of all products and services that are being developed, modified, sold, and serviced. And these instructions must be known and understood by compliance experts in product development, in market introduction, in sales, and in service. And these experts must be influentially part of every business activity that touches upon compliance aspects. And they have to correct adverse situations proactively. And they also need to have access to deeper expertise if they need guidance on very detailed aspects that require really expert interpretation. So these processes are truly very complex. And companies, of course, want to minimize non-compliance because it is very costly. First of all, you have to comply to the law, but also it is very costly if you have non-compliance issues because you will need a redesign or a callback. And it may also cause longer time to market, lost sales, brand reputation damage and liabilities. Of course, companies also want to minimize compliance-induced downsides, such as higher product cost, lower product attractiveness, or longer time to market. So therefore, companies carefully optimize their compliance processes and decision-making to achieve these conflicting goals. 
and these intangible assets are an essential part of their competitive armor. It is something that companies invest in for years and have to be good at. And if you're good at it, you want to preserve that asset for future use. But the change of legislative framework implies that companies must very substantially change their processes. That is a very large and costly task. Over and above that, it puts an extra load on the very same experts who are tasked to ensure compliance in the ongoing operation. And it introduces during and after the transition additional non-compliance risks. And as the original new approach was a best-in-class regulatory approach, the majority of companies see any departure from it to increase both cost and time to market. And decades of standards development investments are actually being dismissed for compliance use in the European Union. That's a huge waste of past investment. And this impasse also creates room for less capable or less willing competitors to ignore the legal requirements and get away with that. That gives them undue competitive advantage over vendors of, non, uh, uh, over vendors of compliant products. So the non-compliant products will gain market share at the expense of the capable bona fide players. And that is exactly opposite what regulations aim to achieve. Even worse, if you have uncertainty about the legal regime, that amplifies these burdens because no one knows if it is worthwhile changing the processes in the company. And if so, to which requirements the new process must comply. What do you need to do? You don't know. But that's the worst of all situations. And de facto, the new approach stopped functioning in the EU in many sectors. And this brought us in exactly this bad situation. Next slide. Or can you hurry up, please? Yes. Last slide. So the current conduct seriously hampers the new approach in many ways. I, I will mention just a few. Standards can only be harmonized when developed under a mandate. The mandates have become so prescriptive that the standardization processes are very seriously hampered. Second, the Commission demands that clause by clause elements of the standard have to be mapped onto elements of the law. That ignores the reality that often several elements in conjunction, sometimes even for complementing standards, cover a legal requirement where none of them does so alone. Third, the Commission wants elements in the standard that do not map onto EU regulations to be non-mandatory. That is incompatible with global harmonization and with the business rationale to cover all relevant aspects in a minimal number of standards. And finally, several sectors face an almost ridiculous backlog of giving standards the harmonized stand status. Standards are piling up for many years without ever getting harmonized. All this is going on for years now, and all attempts for mature dialogue have been on deaf ears. This significantly hampers the supply of competitive products to EU-based customers, and that is very adverse to society interests, especially now companies are struggling for survival because of this pandemic crisis, and an enormous economic decrease is expected. So I hope I place in a business context why industry is crying out to restore the original values of the new approach and to return to a practical conduct that really works. There's too much at stake to leave the EU regulatory regime in jeopardy any longer. Later you will hear the specific and actionable industry recommendations from Meta, but first let me hand over to Katerina and she will illustrate the effect of the current regulatory crisis on the medical devices sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and uh, this was uh, very uh, clear. Um, now we have a new polling time, and we would like to ask you, uh, after hearing Paul, in your opinion, how important is a well-functioning standardization system for European competitiveness in a globalized society? Georgiana, can you open the poll? Yes, the poll is now launched. 
<clears throat> and since some of you had issues with the previous poll in actually uh, putting your, your answer in, uh, it might be because of the full screen mode. So if you are in full screen mode and you cannot put your question in, please uh, deactivate that. We have a lot of votes coming in. 70% of the participants have now voted, so we'll leave a few more seconds for those that still want to do so. Okay. 80% of you voted. I will now close the vote and share the results. All right, so 81 percent of uh, the audience uh, is uh, believing that indeed a well-functioning standardization system is very important for European competitiveness in a globalized society. And 18 persons, uh, very important, uh, sorry, important. Um, anyone else wants to comment on this? If not, um, I will uh, go uh, quickly to uh, the question that we are raised. Um, in fact, we have um, a statement from uh, Malcolm Harbour um, from EPC, who uh, uh, states that the European Parliament took a special interest in standards in its review and approval of the 2012 regulation. As an unintended consequence of passing this regulation, the social and economic value of standardization seems to be put at risk. It is time for Parliament become strongly re-engaged, isn't it? So, uh, indeed, uh, we hope that uh, uh, the, uh, the new uh, Parliament and the new chair of uh, IMCO uh, will uh, give uh, some attention to this issue. Um, well, we had as well... Uh, question from um, Matthias Simon, who is wondering uh, about the Vademecum. It's about four years ago that we had the discussion with uh, DG uh, Grow, and uh, indeed, uh, I believe the Vademecum is now an old story. Uh, it has been replaced by the Commission communication uh, on European standardization from the 22nd of November 2018. Um, I think now we are running a bit over time. It's uh, up to uh, Caterina Brusasco uh, to address us with the special issues on medical devices. Caterina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Philippe. Can you hear me? Very Good well, morning, thanks. everybody. So as Paul has anticipated, I will uh, tell you about standards for medical devices and uh, practical application issues we face in this uh, sector. Next uh, slide, please, Philippe. So first, uh, a short introduction to COSIRA medical devices. Medical device, uh, uh, devices represent devices which are employed in healthcare, so it means for a medical use and they are characterized by a high variety of complexity and a large diversity of technologies. Uh, you can imagine from large, sim uh, from simple uh, device or relatively simple device like a medical thermometer, we go up to very uh, complex device like a positron emission tomography and other uh, similar devices. And uh, uh, medical devices are placed on the market in a highly regulated environment. Today, uh, they follow the requirements of the medical device directives. They will be replaced next year by the new uh, medical device regulation, and both those uh, regulations follow the new approach and so rely on the use of standards uh, as a possible uh, tool for, uh, for the conformity assessment. 
COSIR, COSIR, the trade, European Trade Association, as Philippe uh, anticipated, and it covers uh, four sectors in medical devices, medical imaging, radiotherapy, electromedical equipment, and digital health. So a few examples, uh, X-ray tubes, uh, positron emission tomography, or CT scanners, uh, but also Linux and uh, cyclotron uh, accelerator for radiotherapy, uh, uh, medical ventilators, we have heard uh, a lot about in the COVID crisis and other similar electrotechnical devices. Next slide, please, Philippe. So, COSIR is strongly engaged in standardization. In fact, COSIR members uh, participate actively uh, to international standardization. So they have experts. We have experts uh, in a technical committees of both IEC and ISO uh, standardization organization. But we also offer experts to the expert groups in support of the European Commission on standardization both uh, specifically to medical devices but also at the horizontal level and uh, we also uh, participate to discussion in data standardization at international regulator uh, regulators level so in the imdrf forum for example and COSIR is also funding directly the secretariat of the technical committee 62 of iec which is the one that develops uh, standards for electrical equipment in medical practice and also as a, a, a category A liaison with both IC T662 and ISO TC215, which deals with health informatics. And the category A liaison means that the COSIR can offer experts, can have access to documents, also propose new uh, projects to, um, to IC and ISO technical committees. Uh, next slide, please, Philippe. So this engagement in standardization is justified because of the importance of standards in the medical device sector. And uh, of course, European hospitals, healthcare professionals and patients need a rapid access to medical innovation, to the latest technology medical devices, once it has proven to be beneficial and safe. And standards are the ones that document the state of the art in, for medical devices. So the best practices for a technology or a given uh, uh, sector are in standards. And moreover, it is the international uh, level, it is the international technical alignment, the consensus that uh, we have heard about, which is the reference uh, for the state of the art for medical devices. As, as an example, the most of European standards today uh, between 80% and 99%, so nearly 100%, are identical copies in the, te in the technical part of IC and ISO international standards. And I, I guess for, for COSIR sector, we are really close to 100%. And finally, so the harmonization of, of European standards does facilitate rapid access to medical device to the European single market. So that's, that's what the uh, healthcare professional patients uh, uh, need. Next uh, slide, please, Philippe. So what are the cor current challenges in the harmonization of standards for medical devices? Well, the process which is required uh, for harmonization uh, asks for a detailed mapping of the standard uh, against the requirement of the legislation, as we have heard from the previous panelists. And this has proven to be extremely lengthy and bureaucratic. Uh, we have here an example, uh, five years for a team of experts of COSIR to uh, get this mapping, which is uh, then published in the so-called Annex Z, approved for five standards. And, uh, and there, it was, has been already mentioned, it is quite dramatic for medical device, a serious delay in the harmonization of standards under the current directive. So for example, I have here this uh, the ENIC 6601 series, which is a very important, it is a very important series that, uh, for safety and essential performance of medical devices. 80% uh, of the editions which are currently published in the official journal are outdated. And uh, even there are no uh, new editions uh, since 2012 that uh, has been uh, listed. 
So there are later editions of the standard representing state of the art. They are not in the official journal. The standardization request for the new medical device regulation seems for us to make this harmonization process even more problematic. It uh, seems to presume a, a European-led development of standards. But, uh, standards for medical devices are developed at the international level and uh, seems to trigger a divergence even in the technical content between the European and international standards. But technology is the same as the international level. Next slide, please, Philippe. So what is the impact of these borders on harmonization process on the European single market for medical devices? Well, uh, without harmonized standards, there is no presumption of conformity, and we have heard about that. And at the end, each manufacturer has to interpret himself the legal requirements and on how to demonstrate the conformity then. Uh, it can lead, in principle, to inconsistent and arbitrary, arbitrary approach to uh, the use of standard for the conformity assessment. So, as a consequence, we can see an uneven quality of uh, devices placed on the, on the market, obviously an additional burden on manufacturers, uh, increased time to market and availability for availability of medical device, and uh, finally, a legal uncertainty uh, for, for the manufacturers. Next slide, please. But there is a, an impact also on the international level for from this border harmonization process. Uh, so we see already deviation of European standard from international standards. We, we say that, we say already said the technology is uh, decided or is set at the international level. <clears throat> we see a lack of new European standard because, in fact, uh, more and more international standardization committees ask for decoupling for the European standardization request. That means that uh, international standards keep on being published, but there are no European standards published in parallel. And we also see European technical committees which stop asking the public for publication in the official journals, stop asking for harmonization, they prefer to have a European standard published than to risk the delay of harmonization uh, and, and no publication at all. An example is again for the for the Technical Committee on Respiratory and Anesthetic Equipment, TC215. So as a consequence, a decreased European influence at the international level, reduced international conversion on technical requirements while the technology is in principle the same, endangered global competitiveness of European medical device manufacturers because they have to support additional costs for analysis of the European deviation, and possibly even a shortage of uh, medical devices on the European market if the non-European manufacturer uh, decide not to support uh, those, such additional costs. So next slide is my, my last one. Uh, please, Philippe. Yeah, you have to conclude. Uh, yeah, these are my conclusions. I will just uh, read them uh, for you. So, medical device manufacturers need uh, a European regulatory process showing commitment to harmonized standards as the preferred option for demonstrating conformity. And they need the uh, manufacturer need a European recognition of international standard according to the WTO principle. Uh, they need a timely harmonization of state-of-the-art standard with rapid publication, adequate tra transition times. We cannot have a standard 10 years old uh, uh, harmonized. And they need legal certainty based on presumption of conformity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katerina. Um, now we have a, again a polling time with uh, a question to use and to answer um, uh, the question of uh, Nicole Danjois from uh, COSIR. Uh, it's true that we have uh, uh, about 60% of participants coming from companies and trade associations. There are 20% about coming from um, European Standards Organization or national bodies and uh, the rest is uh, from uh, other stakeholders 
uh, we have about uh, 15, 10, 10, 15 percent of participants uh, um, from uh, uh, the European institutions and uh, national uh, authorities uh, in the member states. So the question uh, after your presentation, uh, Katerina, is to what extent do you believe it is important to resolve the current challenges to the European uh, standardization system? And uh, the, uh, Georgiana, you can open the poll. Thanks, Philippe. The poll is now active and the answers are coming in. So we'll give 10 more seconds. And I will now close the poll. And the results are on screen. Yeah, so again, uh, quite obvious that uh, there is a strong call from uh, the participants in this uh, webinar to fix uh, uh, the current challenges and uh, we will uh, we, we uh, hope that uh, the uh, European policymaker will take that into consideration. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we might uh, shift the answer to uh, the few questions we received um, uh, to, at the end of uh, the seminar and go straight forward to uh, the presentation of um, Meta Pitsu, uh, which uh, will uh, tell us about uh, the new deal that we are looking forward on a European standardization. Meta, the floor is yours. We, we cannot hear you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Thank you for the yeah. floor and please uh, check to the next slide. And also thank you to Katerina and Paul for really making it very clear what kinds of, of uh, challenges is involved here. When people hear about standardization, they just said, I mean, they can't understand what it's all about. How can it be a problem? And it's really difficult to get to, to the bottom of the matter, but I think we, we, we today really heard what it means in reality when you are in a company or if you're dealing with an area like um, medical uh, advices or devices that we had, that uh, that tricky technical issues really becomes a burden for everybody, not only for the companies involved. So what, what we need now is really a new deal, a new deal for European standardization. And what that means is really to restore the trust between the involved parties. Uh, we have to remove the unnecessary burden we have and we have to speed up the harmonization process of standards so that we can make available compliant and safe products on the market in the way we, we know. Uh, the way industry sees it is really that we have to build on the existing system, so, so what we actually know. And that means that it will be the stakeholders' expertise, mainly from industry, who will develop the state-of-the-art technology standards uh, it will then be the uh, European uh, standardization organizations who will facilitate the process in the development, which means they will really build on consensus uh, building to do independent, open, transparent, democratic and inclusive uh, standardization making. And then, of course, there's also a role for the European Commission. They have to oversee that process. They have to make sure that it has the quality it needs. And that means not scrutinizing every single uh, aspect of it, but for us to make sure that the standardization process works and it results in standards that not only comply with the, with the regulations, but much as much with market needs, because that is what drives it uh, from the onset. For member states, you also have a clear role. You have to, of course, acknowledge the system and grant the free circulation of goods that Philippe was talking about earlier when products are produced in line with harmonized standards and make sure that there is no further barriers on the single market. Next slide, please. In order to get there, what do we need to do? Uh, in Orgelim and how many other organizations as well, we believe three things are needed. The first thing is on this slide, and that is really to make an independent assessment of the interpretation of the standardization regulation. 
we, we learned earlier today that, that uh, these changes that we have seen in the system started with a court case. Uh, we really need to have an independent assessment of that regulation uh, and see also the impact on the users and the developers. We need to find out if it is possible to find a more pragmatic uh, solution to change the balance of responsibility when it comes to the standardization system. We need to find out if it is possible for the Commission to bounce back, delegate back some of its powers to the European standardization systems, and also if it is possible not to see standards as an extension of the law. Of course, if this assessment shows this is the way it is, then we will have to see and change the regulation. But we need to be very certain that that's needed and we need to, to investigate all possible means before that and do that in light of what we have heard today, the impact on the users and the developers and also those applying the standards. Second slide, please, or next slide, please, Philip. The second thing we need to we, we think is very important is actually that we restore efficient mechanisms for the development assessment and use of the relevant state-of-the-art harmonized standards. As we heard today, that's not the case. Uh, Paul mentioned the flexibility of the standardization request. It's non-existent today. We need to, to gain more flexibility to, to uh, catch up with the needs in the market and how they develop. And we also need this timely citation so that we can bring the newest, best products, safest products uh, on, on, uh, on the ground, also on the European market. The issue is if, if we see no change, then this system becomes very unattractive. And we see now that quite a few uh, of the people in the standardization system, the industry representatives, they only now work in international standardization. So they give up on the international, on this in the European standardization. It doesn't work that way. We need to be on the forefront and we need to make sure that the system is relevant to industry and the market needs and not as it turns now to be irrelevant to both. Third suggestion on from industry, Philippe, if you take the next, is actually to involve industry and other economic partners as a full partner in the European standardization system. As it is right now, we have the Committee of Standards, uh, which was developed with the regulation, and the only participants here today will be the Annex 3 organization, the standardization organizations, and the European Commission. The, the industry is not part of it. We have now, through the Joint Initiative of Standardization, gotten smart, and we appreciate very much that dialogue possibility we have with the Commission there, but we really believe that we should be in the center together with the other stakeholders. Please, Philip, the next slide. So that we can all stay together and we can resolve our issues together. In our opinion, we believe it's important that Industry is not seen as a problem, but actually as a resource that can help solve all the issues we're facing. So in short, if you turn to the last slide of mine, uh, we have street recommendations from industry. We need an independent assessment of the standardization regulation. We need to install the efficient mechanism for the timely. We cannot hear you, Meta. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Now we can hear you again. Okay. So, in short, we have three recommendations. We need an independent assessment of the standardization regulation. We need to restore the efficient processes that I was talking about before, and you also need to involve industry as a full partner in the standardization system. All these things we believe are needed in order to uh, get to a level where we have more mutual trust. And it is needed actually to bring the standardization system and also the new legislative framework back on track again. We heard earlier this is a necessity not only to keep the internal market working properly, but also to support our European ambition of digital transformation and also sustainability of European society. And of course, as Paul mentioned, also to help us recover fast from the COVID-19. This is not only a call of Orgelim, this is a call of more than 20 trade organizations in various sectors representing European employees, digital technologies, home appliances, toys, and many more business to business. 
we are many who believe there is a need for change and we hope we can do that and at least start that with this seminar today. This is an address not only to all participants here, it's also an address to the member states because you are really the real beneficiary of this system because through that you have the free circulation of products on your market and on the entire Europe uh, based on this system. This was all I, I had to say. I don't know if you want to add anything, Philip, or you want to take from, from here. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Meta. It was very clear. Um, and um, we have a, a final, uh, um, no, last but final polling uh, question. Uh, further to your presentation, to what extent do you consider it is important to re-establish a dialogue between all parties in order to restore mutual trust in the overall system. So please, Georgiana, open the, the, the poll for participants. Yes, I hope you can see it on screen and that you can vote. And indeed, votes are coming in. Okay, so, we've reached 70% quite fast, so maybe a few more seconds and we can close. Stay with us, we have uh, a few questions to answer after that. Also, some statements that are interesting. And here are the results. Right, so again, uh, you all believe that it is important uh, to have a, a strengthened dialogue uh, to uh, sort out the uh, issue that uh, the European standardization system is faced with. So, very good. Um, uh, we are coming to uh, uh, an end uh, to uh, that uh, workshop. I wanted to uh, mention. Um, that we heard uh, last week um, and I will invite all speakers to put on again their camera, their webcam, that at the uh, roundtable organized by our friends uh, last week uh, from EPC, Director Kerstin Jona and DG uh, Grow uh, presented the European Commission's vision of 14 core industrial ecosystem that are necessary to irrigate the economy. And um, she insisted that uh, to attract investments in each of these ecosystems, uh, it, it is uh, very important and, and it needs to be done to achieve one recovery. And for that, we need to work together. We need to identify the, the, the repair needs of these core uh, ecosystem and make them better for the future. Well, as uh, explained by uh, Paul, uh, Katerina and Meta, we have a problem with the current legal framework or its interpretation by the European, European administration that needs repair because there is an increasing number of insular ecosystems that are discouraged by the formal requirements imposed on them and uh, that impact the scope, the formal uh, the, the, the form of uh, standards and eventually the availability of these standards that are uh, needed by uh, businesses. Industry experts uh, that participate voluntarily on the expenses of their companies are asking the Secretariat of the European Standards Organization to cut the link between their technical standards developed under a request of the European Commission and the corresponding union law. This is a bad signal. In the corresponding technical committee of Sensenec and Etsy, uh, they, they ask for this uh, um, uh, disconnection uh, between the, the, the standards um, and, uh, uh, for instance, uh, standards on microwave oven to be disconnected uh, from the low voltage directive or on LAMS as well. Um, 
standards on risk management of medical devices to be disconnected from the medical device regulation on port uh, uh, portable gas stoves uh, to be disconnected from the gas appliance regulation on tractors and agricultural machinery to be disconnected from the machinery directive so these are a few examples but this is a growing trend and this is uh, uh, very uh, worrying the eu paradigm of, of the free circulation of goods on the single market is uh, uh, at stake so um as mentioned by um, uh, meta this is uh, the orgelim code but this is really shared by many more uh, stakeholders and uh, we sincerely hope that um, uh, we will be able to uh, find uh, a solution in the future we um, we trust that um, member states under the uh, upcoming um, presidency of uh, germany will uh, help us in um, uh, bringing uh, all partners around the table and find a, a solution uh, to uh, this uh, problem um, we uh, can go now uh, oh yes we have the last poll in time uh, if you don't mind is uh, would you be interested to take part in a follow-up event on concrete solutions for improving the operation of uh, mandated standardization and uh, we will answer your questions afterwards i see that there are quite a few some are comments. The poll is open. The answers stopped coming in, so I will close the poll now. Wow, that's a plebiscite. So uh, the 114 remaining participants uh, are very uh, interested in uh, following up uh, with this. Um, and thank you for that. So we will take uh, the, the, the the informal alliance of uh, businesses that uh, is behind this um, initiative uh, will certainly follow up uh, this uh, webinar.